thanks to Majors and Quinn for hosting us tonight, and to Joe for getting us organized, and to all of you for coming out to support this independent bookstore and to support us as writers. We really, really appreciate that. For me, and maybe for Joe and Wendy, this is particularly thrilling to be here tonight because my plans for uh, going out and publicizing my book and doing readings got scuttled by the pandemic. My book was published in October of 2019, and it all kind of went south from there, so I'm especially happy to be here tonight. This week marks 12 years since my breast cancer diagnosis, and each July since 2010, or each year since 2010, I've not reached my birthday and thought, oh great, I made it another year. And I have not reached Thanksgiving and thought, oh great, another Thanksgiving with my family. I have reached the end of July, and I'm so, so grateful for another corn season. <laughs> and I want to celebrate tonight that it's a beautiful night, it's the beginning of corn season, and I'm really grateful to be here. Apparently, I have some weird priorities. <laughs> But on the other hand, I like to think that this reflects how grateful I am to continue to experience the small pleasures every day. Corn on the cob, sitting in my gazebo in my garden, reading great books, fresh cherries, coffee with a friend. If you've read my book, you know that I do not believe cancer caused me to be more grateful or changed me in some important way. But I do believe that we all benefit from taking inventory about small things that make our lives good and finding time to dwell on those things a little bit every day. And I think independent bookstores and reading great books are those small pleasures that are so important to making our lives happy lives. So I'm going to read two passages from my book tonight. The first one is about the perils of going out in public in a small town when you first are diagnosed with cancer. Once the word is out that you have cancer, two things happen. One, you have to get down to the business of having cancer, which actually takes a lot of time. If only you could earn a living putting in all those hours. Two, you have to deal with being guilty of having cancer in public. The main symptom of having cancer in public is a lot of eye avertings. It begins with the mammogram technicians on the day you're diagnosed and spreads like an Asian swine bird super virus. You go to Target because you need cat litter and craisins and you can't escape the feeling that the eyes are, aisles are clearing in front of you as you push your cart to the back of the store where the pet supplies are shelved. It's like Moses and the Red Sea. Isn't that Jennifer Smith? Hi, Jennifer. And she's around the corner and down the shampoo aisle before you can get the words out. Of course, this is because people just don't know what to do in an aisle at Target when confronted with the physical manifestation of human mortality especially people who did not hear the news directly from you, but heard it from their neighbor, who heard it from the cashier at the co-op, who heard it from your husband's colleague, who, et cetera, et cetera. You don't know if they know, and they don't know if you know that they know, and you don't know if they know that you know that they know, and so on. This has to go on for a couple of weeks before everyone can assume that everyone knows, and then it's polite for them to just ask how your treatment is going, and you can say, fine, and you can both skip the whole sorry you have cancer thing. This is what manners are for. Besides, they just went to Target because they needed cat litter and craisins, and they really wanted to just get their errands done and go home, and who can blame them? I'm the same way. But then there are the people you run into who clearly don't know. Friends, but not quite first-tier friends, so they didn't get the memo about your diagnosis you sent to those friends a few days back. And they're at Target because they just got back into town from a two-week vacation and there's literally no food in the house, so they have not talked to anyone yet. These people bring the cart to a complete stop, put on a friendly smile and say, I haven't seen you in forever. How are you? You look great. Fine or not fine, that is the question. If you choose fine, then later, when they find out you are in fact not fine, they will feel foolish and terrible and it will be your fault. If you choose not fine and deliver the news right there, they will feel foolish and terrible in the middle of Target, and it will be your fault. If only Miss Manners would weigh in. Then there are the complete strangers who take their customer service jobs way too seriously, maybe because they earn a $5 Starbucks gift card if someone says something nice about them to the manager. Case in point, the clerks at Macy's. 
the clerks at Macy's go out of their way to ask actually pretty invasive questions like, so what have you been up to this morning? What kind of day are you having? What are your plans for this beautiful weekend? I don't know who trains them to do this. I prefer they keep it to a smile and a basic, how are you? It bothers me under even normal circumstances. Under normal circumstances, I smile and say, fine, not much, yes or no, because I was not raised in a barn. But I get a little passive aggressive about it when, to tell you the truth, my afternoon has been pretty awful because I just had an extremely awkward breast MRI to determine whether my cancer is as extensive as my doctor suspects it might be. So I'm guilty of giving the clerk at Macy's way more than she bargained for when she asked how my day was going. All this social navigation is exhausting, and there really is no preparation for it. You could choose to stay home and avoid everyone, but really, what's the point of that? Cancer does not change the essential you, and everyone around you needs to get that message. You still have to go out there and buy the cat litter and change it when you get home besides. You can still laugh and chat in the aisle and care about the upcoming school musical. Just be ready to look people in the eye, speak from your heart, and be the courageous person you've always been, at least as best you can. The second passage I'm going to read is about my first visit with the plastic surgeon, which was something I didn't even know existed before my breast cancer diagnosis. At the big appointment the previous week, when the general surgeon told me what great work his colleagues over in plastics were doing with reconstruction, I was taken by surprise. I did not begin that first week with breast cancer thinking about whether I valued my basic female form enough to contemplate multiple potentially complicated surgeries that stuck at the very core of my beliefs. But here I was, Tuesday of week two, and I found myself walking into yet another medical building for an appointment with a plastic surgeon. The idea of plastic surgery and breast reconstruction had not even been on my radar until the general surgeon mentioned it. Maybe because I was still in the tiny bit of cancer mindset, not in the bilateral mastectomy mindset. This seems like an egregious oversight on my part. There is, after all, a federal law passed in 1998 that requires insurance companies to pay for breast reconstruction after mastectomy. I'm a lawyer and a feminist, but I guess I was busy picking up Legos and making spaghetti in 1998, and I have the odd fortune to know very few women who have undergone mastectomies. Lumpectomies are more the norm in my experience. It's a good example of how, no matter how well educated you think you are, sometimes you pay no attention until something is personally relevant to you. I'm actually rather judgmental about plastic surgery, especially when it comes to breasts. In college, I was the kind of feminist who decided, damn the androcentric, classist, and racist female beauty industry, I won't conform to these ridiculous sexist cultural ideas that doom women to anorexia and other bodily obsessions. I refused to wear a bra, and I did refuse to wear a bra for about 10 years until I was pregnant when the gravity of my breasts threatened to tumble me into the gutter if they didn't have some shoring up. <laughs> the stain for plastic surgery was an easy position for me since I live in a laid back Midwestern college town where typical female attire is decent yoga pants, a fleece jacket over a turtleneck or t-shirt, and Birkenstocks or hiking boots, depending on the season. Actually, that's typical attire for men as well, maybe swapping out the yoga pants for jeans. Pierced ears are the fancy extra, both ears for women, one for men. When I started wearing mascara in 2007 because I noticed that I had pink rabbit eyes in the annual Christmas picture, I felt like a conspicuously painted woman. Even now, I'm reluctant to probe my thinking about plastic surgery too deeply, probably because I fear that when it comes right down to it, I'm actually quite vain and have no principles. But I suppose I am like most people, meaning if you ask me to choose between donating money to starving children in Africa who I don't know personally and going on vacation, I go on vacation. Although maybe I take a larger, make a larger contribution to UNICEF that month because of the guilt. So when I thought about years and years, I hoped, of taking my shirt off at night and seeing only a flat, bare landscape in the mirror, I couldn't bear it. But on the other hand, to be fair, I was only in my 40s. In the previous five years, I decided I wanted to look great in middle age in a more conventional way than I'd previously pursued. Call it a midlife vanity crisis, 
Maybe a concession of youthful principles to the realities of aging. Maybe too much what not to wear, watched in theory to keep my feminist cultural analysis skills sharp. <laughs> in the couple of years before my diagnosis, I lost weight, started strength training, and threw out the baggy clothes that had accumulated in my closet after my kids were born. I'd not had body issues as a young woman, but I'd not really embraced looking great either, whatever that meant, until recently. And suddenly it seemed I was going to be relegated back to hiding in clothing akin to flower sacks. So I found myself walking down the dingy halls of a suburban medical office building looking for the office of Dr. Smith. The fluorescent lights overhead, overhead dimly illuminated the faded salmon and turquoise mid-80s decor which did not fit with my ideas about plastic surgeons' offices at all. <laughs> the dreariness of the building made me feel a little better, because at least apparently I was not going to see a swanky plastic surgeon. <laughs> the office itself was somewhat cheerier, and the people were friendly, although they did not seem the least bit interested in my general health. I think in my two-year marathon of appointments in that office, they took my blood pressure twice, required by law once a year. Ashley, Dr. Smith's assistant, was not a nurse, but she was always sweet and kind to me. More importantly for her job, perhaps, she was statuesque, well-dressed, and while not quite beautiful, knew how to create the illusion that she was. And she knew how to use a camera, which turns out to be an important qualification for a plastic surgeon's assistant. Ashley ushered me into an exam room, told me to strip from the waist up, and handed me the most inadequate exam gown I had yet encountered a disposable pink bolero type jacket. It went not quite to my waist and the feeling reminded me of toilet paper and campground pit toilets. Maybe this was supposed to make me feel better about selling out to plastic surgery. No plush French terry robes here. When Dr. Smith and Ashley swept into the room, I began to doubt my decision. Dr. Smith is a very handsome man. Let me say that up front, that he is also a wonderful and caring doctor, skilled and professional, and he took excellent care of me through some pretty tough times. But at first I thought he looked like a high-end huckster, maybe a big stakes gambler, maybe the brains behind an international art heist. Too slick to be trusted in any case. His suit was exceptionally well tailored, and in a pinch he could probably light the surgery suite with the shine on his wingtips. He also had great hair, my mind immediately jumped to Grey's Anatomy, and I wondered if the office supply closet got a lot of traffic. <laughs> I'm not the only one to think this way. It was de rigueur that when Dr. Smith left a room, e.g. a surgical prep cubicle or a hospital room where I was confined to the bed, the next woman into the room would say, he's such a nice man, <laughs> which I believe was code for, my goodness, he's handsome. <laughs> Even female doctors were compelled to say this, postmenopausal female doctors. <laughs> and when a colleague at work who had just come through the breast cancer gauntlet herself emailed me to say that Dr. Smith had been her surgeon, her first words were not, he's a great surgeon. They were, he's sure easy on the eyes. <laughs> I found, found myself standing at attention, my pink wrapping having fallen to the floor with a very handsome, slightly untrustworthy man in an expensive suit kneeling in front of me with a tape measure, inches from my sagging belly, measuring the width of my areolas and distance between my navel and my breastbone. While he was down there, he also gauged some abdominal fat to see if it would suffice for natural tissue migration, an option instead of implants. When he announced that I did not have enough ab fat to make two replacement C-cut breasts, I was relieved. <laughs> At that point, you take your comfort where you can find it. <laughs> As the patient, what exactly are you supposed to do during this strange experience? Somehow, being examined standing up is worse than being examined lying down. At least lying down, you can pretend that you're sick and keep better tabs on the bolero jacket. And just where do you look? Do you look down at the doctor's very full head of hair? Do you look Ashley in the eye and make small talk? Do you close your eyes and think of England? <laughs> I chose eyes open over my left shoulder at the door, and I stuck to that for the next two years. Hi, everybody. Mary, that was beautiful. I'm just going to go ahead and lower the bar from there. <laughs> um, I'm Wendy Webb. Uh, thank you all for coming. I uh, write novels that they call gossip.
gothic suspense. But what they really are are mysteries involving families that bubble up to the surface at inconvenient times, usually set in a big old house that might be a little bit crumbling. And when I turned my first book in to my editor, she said, oh, wow, this is a great gothic. And I thought, yeah, yeah, it is. And I, I hadn't <laughs> intended to write in that genre, but I just wrote the book I wanted to read. It happened to be that. And I certainly didn't intend to invent a genre, but apparently nobody has set gothic novels up here before. You know, the Southern people love their Southern Gothics, and you've got Gothics in England set on the moors and in Cornwall, but nobody had ever set one up around Lake Superior. So reviewers started calling me Queen of the Northern Gothic, which is slightly embarrassing, but then when I thought about it, it's like, Queen of anything? Okay, I'll take that. I try to get my friends to call me that, nobody would. Um, so that gives you a little bit of insight into my friends. <laughs> um, but so what I thought I'd do, um, I'm here to talk about a couple of things, but this is my most current book. It's called The Keepers of Metz and Vallo. And it, w it was uh, published in November. And it was written during the pandemic. And that explains why this one is a little bit dark, um, darker than some of the rest of mine. Um, and I'll read a little bit um, of my spooky prologue. And then I'll talk about it a little bit and talk about the, um, the process I had of coming up with this kind of strange story. Um, so a, a little fun fact here. This is only the second time I've read this out loud. This came out during the pandemic, so nobody did readings like this. So this is really cool for me. Thank you all for coming to listen. Um, she huddled next to the trunk of an ancient tree and gazed up at the stars shining through the canopy of impossibly tall pines. They looked black against the night sky, brooding, plodding. She had wandered into the forest earlier in the evening, long before the blues and purples of twilight turned into inky darkness. The night had been safe then. She knew better than to leave the house when nightfall was near. Her grandmother had always warned her about that. But the light had caught her eye. It was faint and flickering low, but she stepped into the path and followed it into the woods then deeper still into the forest glen where she had encountered the bear and her two cubs earlier that spring. And then the light became brighter. It looked like the flame of a tiny torch dancing through the trees, flitting this way and that. She was mesmerized by it, not realizing how deep in the forest she was until she turned around and saw that she had strayed from the path. She couldn't see it anywhere. She didn't know which way she had come, and now the light was gone. As the darkness fell around her like a shroud, she began to hear whispering voices floating through the pines. She couldn't make out what they were saying, but they seemed to be coming closer. Were they happy voices? Malevolent ones? Were they singing? She listened closely, holding her breath as though the very act of breathing would drown them out. As they came nearer, she tried to disappear into the tree trunk, not wishing to see whatever was whispering. She closed her eyes. When she opened them again, they were all around her. I'll read a little bit of chapter one. The key refused to turn. Annalise pulled on the door and jiggled its wrought iron handle, a massive thing with intricate whorls and swirls forged in another time. The door, too, was formidable, solid, well-aged oak with a curved top, and it wasn't budging. Sometimes it sticks. Annalise looked over her shoulder at Martin, the caretaker, who seemed as ancient as the door itself. I remember, she said, smiling at him. Maybe that's why it was never locked. Let me try, he said, taking the key from her hand. He gave the door a mighty pull and turned the key at the same time. She heard a heavy snap as the key hit its mark. Martin pushed the door open and stepped aside. 
<laughs> to Annalise, it was like he had opened the door to her childhood. Metzen Vallow, her great-grandparents had named this fortress of a house Forest Light when they built it on Ile de Colette, an, isle, an island in Lake Superior just off the coast of Wharton, a popular tourist getaway. They had come to the island to put down roots in a time when the forest that surrounded the house was deeper and darker and even more foreboding than it was now. And to hear her grandmother tell it, full of spirits and demons and danger. Metzen Valor was new, when the ancient trees had not yet fallen to the lumberman's ax, when mystery and wisdom still permeated the land and the water and the sky. Annalise held her breath and stepped into the grand entryway, gazing up to the ceiling two stories above. As she walked into the main room, she saw it was much the same as she remembered. Dark wood floors weathered with age, enormous wooden beams along the ceiling hewn generations ago from the ancient trees. Turning to the kitchen, Annalise remembered the formidable stove always seemed to be warm. A wood-burning oven was built into the wall and the massive wrought iron chandelier hung from a chain above the dining room table that was large enough for 12. The fireplace, crafted from the stones her ancestors had gathered along the property, stretched all the way up to the ceiling. Okay, and it had been a long time since Annie had last visited. So here's what happens in this tale. Um, Annalise, our heroine, goes back to her grandparents' home on an island in Lake Superior following the death of her grandmother. Her family gathers there for the reading of the grandmother's will. And as it happens in a lot of wealthy families, that reading of the will doesn't ever go very well. <laughs> and um, this one doesn't go very well either. But the, so that's kind of the, the undercurrent of this. And, but Annie and her brother Theo, her twin brother, find um, that since her grandmother is not on the property anymore, things kind of have seemed to gone, have gone haywire. And that's kind of all I'll say about that. But now I'll segue into the, what kind of made me think of this story in the first place. As I said, it was the pandemic and I, I kind of had a one-two punch because I was sick before the pandemic. I, I got sepsis from a paper cut. Oh, no. And yeah, and my friend who's a writer, Jess Lurie, who you might know, said, Wendy, you're the only one who can claim workers comp um, from paper cut and sepsis. <laughs> Um, but, um, so that happened, I was in surgery on March 12th of 2020 and March 13th was, everybody was locking down. So I kind of had a one-two punch there and I'm like, nobody is going to be around me. I am going to be in my own little bubble. And in that little bubble, I started thinking about my mom who had recently passed away. She is of Finnish descent and I started thinking about Finnish lore and legend, and I didn't really know much about it. it. And so I started researching it, and I found that the Finns have a legend about little people, like the Irish do, and a lot of other nationalities. You know, the Irish have fairies, and a lot of other nationalities have um, these legends about these little sprites that are in nature, and are either friendly and happy and helpful, but by turns uh, they're not. And um, so in, I started researching a little deeper and found that J.R.R. Tolkien actually used the uh, poem, kind of an epic poem of the Finnish people, it's called the Kalevala, as his source material for Lord of the Rings. And he even learned the Finnish language to read it in the original language. And I thought, well, if it's good enough for him. <laughs> and I started looking at it, and it was this tale of elves and spirits and things in nature. And one of the major things was that, um, you know, Gandalf could control everything, could control the weather. So could the Finns or so they 
led people to believe, specifically the Vikings who were marauding around that time. And they kind of put the word out, they must have had some good PR, that if the Vikings tried to come and sail to Finland, they would sink their ships because they could control the seas. Or they'd send lightning, or they'd send wind. And the Vikings believed them and sort of left them alone. So I'm thinking, hey, that's really cool about my heritage. Again, I tried to get my friends to call me Gandalf, and they wouldn't. <laughs> so, uh, but it just kind of got me thinking. You know, everybody in their heritage has these old legends. But what if they weren't legends? And what would they look like now? And how would we, in modern society, kind of navigate um, through all that mystery and lore? And so that was the impetus for this book. Um, and I, you'll notice I have a second book because it's my, my little shameless self-promotion. My next book, my uh, ninth book is coming out, or my eighth book is coming out um, November 1. And it's called The Stroke of Winter. And it's another spooky tale about a woman who finds out some inconvenient things about her family and has to navigate through it. So I thought I'd bring it. If anybody, this is an advanced reader's copy. So if anybody wants it, just let me know and I'll give you a preview. Thank you very much. You two are tough acts to follow. <laughs> uh, my name is Joe Berman. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Um, I'm originally from St. Louis Park, and these days I live out in Massachusetts with my family. Um, uh, my job for the past 25, almost 30 years, has been uh, writing and edi editing educational textbooks for science and math. And so I, I have all of this written output that's out there, but my name is never on the cover. You would never, open up these books, you would never know it was me inside. So here I've got my novel, and it's, there is my name on the cover, and it's exciting, <laughs> but it's also scary, because I don't have anything to, I don't have any professors or anybody to hide behind anymore. Every word in here has got to be me, so uh, thank you for coming and for listening. Um, I'm going to read the prologue which is entitled Arnold and Mary, A Love Story. Um, there is one very nasty word in this prologue, and I'm going to edit it out. <laughs> and that tells you that I'm a lot more daring and adventurous in writing than I am in person. <laughs> Arnold Knudsen met his wife, the former Mary O'Boyle, at the Palmer House Hotel of Chicago, Illinois, on a hot August evening of the year 1922. He was a guest of the hotel in town to convince the Chicago Grain Exchange to include mushroom futures among its tradable commodities. She was the waitress serving him in the dining room. They're too full of themselves even to listen to me, Knudsen complained to Mary the waitress, who had joined him at his table on his invitation. Knudsen was slicing and eating the T-bone special throughout their conversation. Bits of juice and Worcestershire sauce kept dribbling down his chin and onto a white napkin. They have been dining on beefsteak and barley since the Battle of Little Bighorn, so naturally they think of mushrooms as frivolous, valueless little foodstuffs right up there with parsley. I can get you some mushrooms if you want, said Mary, the lilt in her voice as alive and enticing as dew on a daisy. No thanks, but I'll take a few more slices of bread if you would be so kind, he said. With an impish grin and her heart singing, Mary O'Boyle skedaddled into the kitchen. She imagined that her fellow waitresses would crowd around her in girlish excitement, prattling on about the fine young gentleman who was lavishing such attention upon her. Instead, the women screwed their eyes disapprovingly and told her to grow up. Most of the other waitresses were older women who wore their hair in tight buns and served customers with lipless frowns. To them, the patron in question was a gawky rube in a cheap linen suit and a dumb bow tie, clearly a palooka from the boondocks, and dearie, take it. Dearie, there ain't nothing worse than the boondocks, take it from us. But Mary O'Boyle thought the rube was very nice. Mary O'Boyle, both a Palmer House waitress and an American resident of three months standing, had emigrated from a barren homeland that she had come to believe would curdle her youth, energy, and fiery red hair as surely as Phytoptora and Festans drained the strength and sap of a healthy potato. Her American contacts, an aunt and uncle in Chicago, had promised her a waitress job in what turned out to be a famous hotel and a bed in what had proven to be a large closet. 
Mary accepted both without question because everyone told her that America was the land of opportunity. You must remember, said Arnold Knudsen, that America is the land of opportunity. He brandished a bread slice for emphasis. What this means is that the accepted norms of today could very well be the forgotten past of tomorrow. I say you have lovely eyes. What is your name? Mary, replied Mary, the first syllable hanging in the air long after the second one had slipped away. Well, Mary, said the young man in the cheap linen suit and polka dot bow tie, I have seen the future, and it is spelled F-U-N-G-U-S. <laughs> he noticed her eyes widen with each letter. Did you know, he whispered conspiratorially, that a meal of mushrooms provides a man with more vitality and natural humors than three servings of chicken, meat, or fish? I dare say, replied Mary O'Boyle. It's true. It was proven in a study conducted at a respected medical school some years ago. One test group ate a steady diet of whatever foods they liked as much as they wanted. The second group was fed mushrooms and only mushrooms for three weeks, three weeks running. By the end of the experiment, the men who dined freely were fat, bloated, and as weak as jellyfish. The mushroom men, however, well, well, what, said Mary O'Boyle. In the corner of her eye, she could see an older gentleman at a distant table waving furiously in her direction. She had taken his order at some forgotten time previously. I fear I cannot discuss the results with a lady such as yourself, said Arnold Knudsen, and his fair-skinned, hairless face turned a beet shade of red that he tried to hide underneath the dabbings of his napkin. It was then that a burly man in a greasy black suit strode up to the table and insinuated himself into the conversation. Miss O'Boyle, he growled, may I have a word with you in my office? Had Arnold Knudsen not followed the waitress and the burly man into the burly man's office, which in fact was merely a desk in the corner of the kitchen, then life in Fergus Falls would have been irrevocably different from that moment onward. For a few pointless minutes, Arnold Knudsen sopped up the last of the steak juices with tasteless white bread and continued for his own amusement the diatribe about the merits of fungi. It eventually had dawned upon him to wonder what had happened to his waitress and companion, and with a flick of his boater hat, he went to look for her. He caught up to her just as the burly man in the greasy black suit was showing Mary to the back door and the alley beyond. Did you fire this girl, Knudsen spat? This is outrageous, I won't hear of it. Mary O'Boyle couldn't help but smile at her would-be savior. And just why, sneered the burly man, the bristles of his thick mustache wavering not an inch, can't I fire a waitress just like that? He snapped his fingers in front of Knudsen's face. Arnold Knudsen shuffled his brain for an answer. He imagined himself a gentleman farmer in the tradition of Washington or Jefferson, as well as a man as modern and urbane as any of the fine businessmen who graced luxurious establishments such as the Palmer House Hotel. Of course he would see that the pedantic boor before him would not fire the innocent young lady whom he had befriended. All that remained was how this was to be accomplished. The solution was money. How delightfully simple. With great elan, Arnold Knudsen reached for his billfold and rifled through the treasure. He emerged with a motley collection of currency that he thrust into the burly man's ugly little face. There, Knudsen said gallantly, I think this shall solve any problem you may have. Am I correct, sir? The burly man looked curiously at Knudsen's offering. He counted the bills and coins quite carefully to a total of $5.13. The burly man looked up at Knudsen in a totally different light. Well, sir, he said, you are most generous, most generous indeed. Knudsen grinned smartly to the waitress as the burly man stuffed the bills and coins into a deep pants pocket. I'd say you've purchased yourself a waitress, continued the burly man. Oh, what do you mean, asked Knudsen. I mean the two of you may together get the hell out of my kitchen, he replied, <laughs> quite suddenly all bluster again. Both of you, now! Just like that, Arnold Knudsen found himself alone with Mary the waitress in the back alley behind the kitchen. <laughs> He was fuming like a stock pot with its lid slammed shut. Of all the, I, I'm talking to the hotel manager about this. Never in my life have I been treated. I'm, Knudsen struggled onward mightily. Will you marry me? He blurted out. What? Squealed Mary O'Boyle. You must marry me. I won't hear anything less, said Knudsen with a rapid resolve. Almost as an afterthought, he grabbed her around the waist and kissed her resolutely. After a short moment of deliberation, she kissed him back. Mary insisted on their taking the next train out of town, lest either of them change their minds. The train conductor married them just as they lurched past Kenosha, Wisconsin, 
Although the man had never before performed such a ceremony, nor realized he held the power to do so, the bridegroom pointed out the conductor was no less capable than a justice of the peace or a ship's captain, and the train conductor found no counter-argument at his disposal. Two porters and a passenger named Solomon Walsmud served as witnesses. At the Milwaukee station, the bride sent a telegram to her aunt and uncle, and by Madison, the newlyweds had retired to their compartment, a bottle of sparkling ginger ale at their bedside. The ginger ale was an impromptu gift from the train crew, prohibition barring anything less prosaic. As towns and pasture land passed invisibly through the night, Arnold's newfound wife gradually lapsed into a fragile sleep, one he assumed was draped in postcoital bliss. By the following <laughs> afternoon, long after the rolling hills of Wisconsin had given way to the flat, oh so flat prairie of Minnesota, the conductor finally announced their arrival in Fergus Falls. Yet the newly deemed Mrs. Mary Knudsen peered out the train window and found herself less than fully resolved to disembark. The overwhelming stench of agriculture did not help matters. Ah, the smell of the future, cried her husband exuberantly. Perched aboard a horse-drawn buggy, her husband of one day standing snuggled awkwardly at her side. The young Irish immigrant surveyed her surroundings. In many ways, downtown Fergus Falls reminded her of what she had left behind in Chicago or even Dublin. The bumpy streets were an ill symphony of people, horses, carriages, old men with push carts, women with ragged children in tow, all rushing about in different directions. She noticed some fine hats for sale at the Fergus Falls Millinery, and next to that a store that sold grains and coffee out of large oaken barrels, and next to that a barber shop. Yet periodically interrupting such vistas were evidence of an extremely foreign culture, even to a country lass such as herself. They passed a large wagon load of deep black sheep manure, driven by a team of two drays and steered by an old farmer and his wife, both dressed in overalls and straw hats, and all smelling like an exhausted privy. Mary assumed it was sheep manure because of the telltale bits of wool that dotted the wagon's cargo and floated casually behind as it passed. She surprised herself with feelings of superiority over these people, perhaps because she still was dressed in the uniform of the Palmer House, sweaty, <laughs> unpressed, donned and redonned uniform, though it was. Why, asked Mary as politely and inoffensively as she could manage, is this town full of shit? <laughs> Arnold Knudsen brought his head back from the clouds and looked at her quizzically as if noticing her for the first time since their arrival. Haven't you been listening to me, my dear, he exclaimed. Mushrooms grow from manure, and here we grow mushrooms. This is Fergus Falls, Minnesota, the mushroom capital of America. And your business, Mr. Knudsen, she, she murmured, that would be mushroom farmer, of course. But my goodness, Mary, you should call me Arnold. We are married, you know. <laughs> they, strode in, they rode in silence for the rest of the trip. The carriage eventually came to rest at the very edge of town at what appeared to be a small, dilapidated farm. A few scrawny chickens clucked forward to greet them, and a horse whinnied in the distance. The one-story house was more like a large shack with peeling white paint revealing gray wood underneath, a slate roof as uneven as the downtown streets had been bumpy, and the windows either cloudy or full of cracks or absent altogether. Behind the house were row upon row of flat clapboard beds with mushrooms of all sizes poking out of them. In the front yard, measuring at least 20 feet across and just as tall, lurked a stinkier pile of animal excrement than Mary O'Boyle Knudsen would have imagined in her oddest, most obtuse nightmares. Welcome to your new home, love of my life, sang the gawky stranger in a rumpled beige linen suit. Mary jumped out of the carriage and ran as quickly as she could in no particular direction, stopping abruptly when her way was blocked by a large oak tree that smelled as ingrained in excrement as everything else in town. She collapsed to the ground at the base of the big oak, at which she commenced to wail and pound with her tiny fists, her tears bubbling forth like a wellspring, pooling on the sun spongy soil and seeping into whatever world lay beneath. There is more. I'm going I'm to keep reading. A couple more pages. Farley McTree, the dry goods merchant, bent over the little carriage and cooed and clucked at the tiny package therein, a baby girl in terry cloth leggings and a lacy pink bonnet. Ooh, hiya, 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 he warbled through mottled larynx and yellow teeth. She's a pretty one, she is, just like her mother, if you don't mind me saying. Thank you, Mr. McTree, replied Mrs. Knudsen correctly. You are very kind. As Mr. McTree bowed ever so slightly, she continued her stroll down the sidewalk of Van Buren Avenue, pushing with no effort the white wicker baby carriage. Other men tipped their hats and stepped out of her way as she approached. 
That Mrs. Knutson is quite the fine lady, said a man in front of the barber shop. I'll say she is, said the barber, pulling on his suspenders. The year was 1929. For the better part of seven years of married life, Mary O'Boyle Knutson endeavored toward the highest standards of dress, housing, bearing, and personal hygiene that her husband's income would allow. While she held only the vaguest idea of how great that income might be, clearly it was quite substantial because attaining the highest standards of living proved remarkably easy. At the farmhouse, Mary contracted for biannual coats of paint and a weekly scrubbing of the windows, replacing the broken ones as necessary. She banished to the woodpile her husband's mildewy sofas and armchairs, replacing them with finely crafted furniture of the federal style, complemented by genuine Persian carpets from Persia and oriental floor lamps from the Orient. When they proved tiresome, she redecorated in a faux Egyptian motif, including sculpted settees and tall ceramic pots and wall hangings of pharaohs and assorted goddesses, all imported from Cairo, Egypt, via a barge that transferred in Cairo, Illinois. Her name, face, and figure were well known to each of the town's dressmakers who fashioned elaborate and splendid garments in imitation of patterns created in France or Italy, typically encompassing unusually silky fabrics and lots of frills or tassels around the waist and bust. At times, Mrs. Knutson ordered such garments from France and Italy directly. On a different front for a month's worth of Tuesdays, Mary ventured the morning's journey to St. Cloud for half-hour appointments with a voice trainer. He cut and shaped her Irish brogue until it was as flat and proper as the Minnesota prairie, and when he was finished, he threw in a few Gilbert and Sullivan arias for only a nominal fee. When the renovation of the farmhouse was complete, Mary staged musical recitals, first featuring her own talent, then the talent of others in the community, then travelers from other regions of the great land they all called home. Next came high teas, thematic brunches, dramatic readings, scholarly lectures, and quite famously, an annual costume ball in which the doges and doyens of Fergus Falls entertained one another in the guises of pirates, princes, and assorted pagan deities. Most significantly, at least in her own mind, she installed the finest wash tubs, ceramic tiles, and other bath time accoutrements that mail order delivery could provide. She availed herself of these fixtures at least twice a day, three times during the summer. The business of growing mushrooms may stink up this town, wrote the former Mary O'Boyle in her diary, but it shall not stink up me. If one doubt nagged at her mind, it was the important yet disingenuously meaningless question of how her expansively elegant lifestyle was being supported. For never, not once, did she remit hard cash for any purchase dearer than an ice cream soda. To every merchant and service provider in town, and even to those elsewhere, a credit in the name of her husband sufficed for payment. It was as if the name Arnold Knutson held people in a magic trance eager to obey his wife's bidding. The mushrooms are a bloomin', Arnold exclaimed proudly one day as he sauntered in from the fields, odoriferous effluvia matted to his pale skin. Not in my living room, cried Mary as she shooed him into the screen porch where she had installed a hose and a trough. The mushrooms are kind of limp, moaned Knutson on a day the following year, this time collapsing his gawky frame on a bench several yards away from the house, which had become as close as his wife would allow him to approach while staying from agriculture. I think the ranchers changed the mix on that last batch of excrement. Too much pig, probably, and not enough chicken. I bought a piano today, Mary shouted gaily from the house. It comes with 12 hours of lessons. We lost the entire crop, spoke Knutson matter-of-factly at dinner one evening on a subsequent year. He and Mary sat on opposite ends of the table as their cook served a fine meal of lake trout fillets with a mushroom and red pepper garnish. Oh, what happened, dear, asked Mary. Her attention was still focused on the operatic recital of the previous evening, during which a high note from the soprano visibly rattled the Verano glass goblets, balanced on the mantelpiece, a thrilling moment for all assembled. A fungus got them, he mumbled through bites of fish. <laughs> Mary considered this for a moment. I thought mushrooms are fungus, dear. Different kind, replied Knudsen unhappily. In bed that night, dressed in a flowing chenille nightgown of the sort worn by women nowhere else in the state, Mary tuned to her husband and casually broached the subject of money. Stocks and bonds, he muttered through the thick downy pillows. What, my darling? Stocks and bonds, he repeated. Mary stroked his blonde hair, which was thinning slightly on top. Plus, everyone in town owns a share of this farm. The two would never speak about finances again. As the years passed, Mary noticed her husband spending less and less time tending his mushroom beds 
nor stocking the excrement piles, nor hauling his knobby little produce to the depots in town. Such tasks he left to the foreman, a Japanese named Mr. Yamaguchi, and to an increasing number of farmhands and day workers. She deemed these changes to be quite appropriate, especially in light of the steady stream of embossed letters and fancy envelopes postmarked New York City, New York. Curiously, whatever news those letters contained seemed never to cheer her husband all that much. Rather than pour over journals and newspapers while wearing a smoking jacket, which was how Mary imagined Arnold would be spending more and more of his leisure time, he instead took to a small shed on the north end of the property where, as he told his wife and whoever else might ask, he was experimenting with the cultivation of new and unusual varieties of edible fungus. The mushroom business is built around one extremely common species, which we know as Agaricus competris. Uh, Knudsen would orate to most anyone who would listen, such as the women's group his wife had organized. Most people place the taste of this mushroom between acceptable and inoffensive, which is all well and good. The glasses with which the druggist had fit him made him look vaguely bird-like during those years, an image enhanced by the strained muscles stretched over his neck and the ruddiness of his nose, which was enlarging and reddening mysteriously. But ladies, I submit to you that the future of mushrooms lies with more exotic specimens, he orated. The chanterelle, the greenish russula, the pine cone, the morel, the bolitus luteus. Why can't we raise these delicious, enticing entrees in the hallowed mushroom beds of Fergus Falls? Here, here, called a blue-haired woman from the back row. I will tell you why, madam, said Knudsen with hearty forcefulness, because no one knows how to domesticate the little blighters. An audible gasp coursed through the women, and one of the more elderly among them fainted. Mary Knudsen rushed to her side, her face twisted in reproach at her husband. Whoever figures out the mystery of the greenish Russula, my dear ladies, he will raise Fergus Falls to true greatness, continued Arnold. My wife seems to be telling me we are out of time, so I will leave you with my sincere thanks and good wishes. He scurried away from the tepid applause and beelined to his laboratory in the small shed. Somewhere in those years, the Knudsen's managed to conceive their one and only child, a daughter whom they named Sarah. On a moderately frigid day in October, an immaculately and very tastefully dressed Mary Knudsen strolled down the sidewalk of Van Buren Avenue, pushing a carriage that held her baby daughter, soaking in the compliments, silent and vocal alike, of her fellow townsfolk. Just as the sun dipped behind the, sun, the sky's sole cloud, however, a newsboy carrying an armload of the Fergus Falls Examiner blocked their path, not deliberately, but by happenstance. At the top of his youthful lungs, he yelled something about an extra, something about Wall Street, and something about eggs. Men began crowding around him, parting eagerly with their nickels and dimes for news that Mary did not entirely understand. At home, she discovered most of the farmhands surrounding Mr. Yamaguchi, the foreman, who was clutching the same newspaper she had seen for sale in town. You up shit creek, said Mr. Yamaguchi. I beg your pardon, replied Mary Knudsen. Your life is shit full of shit, repeated Mr. Yamaguchi. Although none of the other hands were Japanese or even Asian, each looked at her with the same placid, serious, horror-frozen faces, the same tut-tutting of justified reproach. Mary felt the blood drop from her rosy cheeks like a dead capon thrown from a barn roof. She went looking for her husband, who was nowhere to be found. Mary would continue looking for him the following day, and the day after that, and the day after that, until she gradually concluded that she was better off searching for something else, anything else, in this Fergus Falls, nestled as it was in America, the land of opportunity. The rest of the 20th century passed by in an instant. It would be over before you can turn the page. Ready for the question and answer session? Okay, folks. <laughs> How, should maybe stand up there. Should we? Should we all stand yeah. up? By the, Does anybody by have the, any questions? Comments? Complaints? Jokes? <laughs> so, Joe, did you edit a textbook on fungus? <laughs> it was, what was, what was uh, originally this was going to be a cockroach, which. Um, I thought was cute, but it's actually, there were a lot of other cockroach stories that I had read that time. And then I did have a visit for my work to a uh, mushroom farm in Pennsylvania. And they really do have huge piles of, um, of what, you, what I was talking about. Um, and I said, I got to put that in my novel. 
So why Fergus Falls? I was sitting there listening to you, and it's like, okay, good St. Louis Park boy, now lives in Massachusetts. Did you spend time at Fergus Falls? Uh, this, it begins with my father. Um, when we were growing up, uh, he thought Fergus Falls was a funny name. And when it came up, like on the TV weather report, you know, um, my father would say, hey, Fergus Falls, you know, he, he just liked, he liked the sound of it. It was a funny name. And when it came time to write this novel, I was looking for a city, I was looking for a place that was just outside Minneapolis. You know, not a suburb, but something that's sort of a little further out, so it would be a place I could take over. This, this is a work of fiction, guys. Everything I said about <laughs> Fergus Falls is completely not true. It's just made up. It's not the mushroom capital of America. There, you know, not, none of that's all fiction. This is an invented, this is my invention about, about, uh, about this town. I, I have a question for Mary. Yes, yes, you. Um, uh, you know, breast cancer gets a lot of this attention in, in the world at large. You know, the NFL has breast cancer awareness games where they wear pink. And um, there are all sorts of other campaigns like that. And I'm curious what you think about um, that kind, I mean, that, that kind of attention, does it mean anything to you? Does it enter into your consciousness at all? I find it kind of irritating. Um, okay. Um, I certainly appreciate the support for the research and the money that some of those things raise, but I also feel like it seems to have become about something more than just raising the money and, and supporting you know, I've, who have had. I've had, you know, I've had my share of hospital stays and diseases, and I just wanted to get in and out. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to be a poster child for anything. I didn't want a campaign. I just wanted to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Um, but it does get so that I won't go to, well, I don't want to go to Starbucks anyway, but <laughs> I won't go in those places during, during pink months. Okay. And Other questions for yes. Mary, why did you write the book? Um, it was important for me for processing the experience. I right now am listening to a, a really great book about memory, and it has set me back a little bit thinking about writing this book about how memories are not very reliable actually in general. But um, certainly I have my selfish reasons about, about doing that, whether the memories are true or not. I, I was trying to express some emotional truth about it. I hope I do that in the book about being, I mean, I, I, it was important to me to express both the humorous side of the story, which I think there is to most stories, even when they end tragically. Um, as well as help people just understand what the experience is that you go through with, with that. And I think some humor helps us um, both relate to the experience more and sort of get through the experience. Will there be another book, Mary? <laughs> I, I actually have a novel right now that I'm trying to pitch and I, also, last summer, cleaned out my mother's house. She moved to Minnesota from Ohio. And I found a packet of letters that were related to and from her aunt, Aunt Letty. And Aunt Letty was the subject of an alienation of affection lawsuit in 1941. Oh. And an alienation of affection um, lawsuit, most of which does not exist in the States anymore, is about, like, if I'm married to Jeff, which I am, <laughs> um, and Jeff has an illicit relationship with Sheila, I can sue Sheila for alienation of affection. Oh. And so the, I'm discovering this family history, and I think kind of like Wendy, yeah. I'm really intrigued by this family history. So the next project I'm thinking about is, I mean, I'm more about Aunt Freddie. <laughs> 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 
allegation of affection lawsuits. <laughs> she was the defendant. Uh, yeah, my brother has, uh, he's real into Ancestry.com. I don't know if anybody else is, but he has uncovered some stuff about my family that nobody ever talked about and nobody ever knew, and I'm like taking notes. Like, <laughs> oh, there were some sister wives there. <laughs> uh, there were a lot, of, a lot of things that just got really buried that Ancestry is bringing to light. So you can bet some of that is going to end up in a book yeah. someday very soon. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of us are writers and get really intrigued by these things from our families. And it was one reason I like law school, actually, because every case is a really interesting story. It's like you see the grass on the top, but there's this root system underneath every 1,000 yeah. page that makes it into um, a reporter that you read in law school. Well, and people ask me, too, you know, do you put people you know into your stories? And I say, heck yeah. <laughs> yes, I know a lot of interesting people. Did you kind of draw on people that you knew from? I, when I started the novel, I made a conscious decision to not base any of the characters or not name any of the characters out of anybody in my family. Yeah. And I broke the rule once. <laughs> Arnold Knudsen, that is named after my uncle Arnold. Oh. Yeah. Who has absolutely nothing to do with that character. He was not character. a mushroom farmer. No, no. He has absolutely nothing to do with him. But I put him in because I thought, okay, if he was alive, he'd, he'd get a kick out of it. <laughs> but otherwise, there are no Berman family members in here. And that was, it was actually very liberating to make that decision. Because it left yeah. me free to write whatever I wanted, not have to worry about, gee, what would, what would this aunt or uncle think about this you know, character based on it? No, none of that. Well, and I've set now four, going on five, um, of my novels in the same small town that I invented, and I call it Wharton, and fooling no one, it's Bayfield, Wisconsin. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't name it Bayfield because I, you know, and none of the, uh, you know, I've actually kind of sparked a little tourism, a little book tourism. People will read my books and then go to Bayfield and go to the different locations and see if they can kind of, oh, yeah, that's this place, and that's that place, and, and that's been fun, but I didn't want to use the real names because, you know, some ugly things happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't want to offend anybody, um, so I did that, but everybody knows it's big. Um, actually, Mary, on a related topic, it seems like you do call out real people in Baker's uh, The Nurse, The Doctor, mm -hmm. or probably to, to that. Um, Did you have to get permission? I changed names. Ah, okay. Yeah, I changed names, but in terms of memoir, I mean, it, it, it was my actual experience, so um, I felt like it was important to describe what I experienced. Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> Jill, question for you. Did you know that of the, the Gothic expression Fergus Falls was fungus glass. I grew up in Fergus Falls. Oh, you did? Oh. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> We're friends of Mary's, but there, our rivals would call us you know, Fungus Falls, Fungus Glass. I had no yeah. idea. Yeah. That is, I actually have contacted. Yeah, it was just a slam. A slam show. Yeah, we're going to, I have to say we're going to Fungus Falls. I have contacted a person or two from that community and uh, like a librarian there and other people, and nobody ever mentioned that to me, so that's, that's funny. <laughs> the, uh, the mushroom farm that I visited all those years ago was in Pennsylvania. Yeah, there's no mushrooms. There are no mushrooms no. out there. No, you won't find them. It's funny the um, unintentional things that you get right. <laughs> you know, I've had that happen many times in my novels. Um, especially with this Bayfield Wharton thing. And I just, you know, made one of them kind of a ghost story. And um, then uh, they asked me, this was a few years ago, to speak to the high school at Bayfield. And then, you know, during the question and answers, one of the teachers put up her hand and she said, well, you know, this school is haunted. And I said, what? She said, oh, everything is haunted in this town. I thought you knew that. And I was like, Oh, I didn't know that. Now, do you have any personal experience, or do you have any stories of your own of encountering? I do. 
I, that's a risky question for me to ask, but I'm feeling very braver. I'm feeling braver now than I did like <laughs> an hour ago. I do. Um, people ask me that all the time, and I don't know if it's because, and my books aren't ghost stories, but there might be a ghost floating in and out. Um, so the, 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 the main idea is not, oh my gosh, my house is haunted, I've got to get this ghost out. It's maybe there's the ghost of Aunt Millie in the, in floating around in the attic. But, um, so I have that on the, on the brain and weird things happen to me all the time though. And I will just tell you one, I got some real good stories. One is kind of scary, but one that happened right in this neighborhood. I was walking my dog who I've had here at readings uh, before she's since passed on, but she was a hundred pound Alaskan Malamute. And I was walking her right in this neighborhood in the dead of winter, and it was a really cold day. And I used to like to walk her around 10 a.m. when everybody had gone to um, school or work or whatever, and there weren't a whole lot of people in the neighborhood, and we could just do our business and get home. And so we were doing that, and I was over by the Greek church, and um, I noticed this black thing rolling across the road. And I thought, well, that. And I got up toward it and it rolled across my path and I looked at it and it was a black balloon. And I thought, well, it's below zero. What is this balloon doing just cruising down the street at, at its own volition? It wasn't windy. The balloon was just rolling. And so I thought, okay. And I walked my dog and um, about 20 minutes later, got back to my house. What was waiting for me at the bottom of my front steps was that balloon. And I freaked out, I had my phone in my pocket, I took a picture of it, and then I ran inside and put it on Facebook and <laughs> told everybody. So that's the kind of weird things that happen to me. I did have another experience that I'll tell quickly, again with um, walking one of my giant Malamutes um, in the winter, this happened in Duluth. Um, again, about 10 in the morning, but this time it was well below zero just after a snowfall. And you know how after a snowfall all the sounds are kind of muffled? I, you could hear nothing just except my little mucklucks on the snow. Except I started to hear this creaking noise and it was kind of a rounded the corner and I don't know how familiar you, are, you all are with Duluth but there's a neighborhood that has all these big old mansions 150 year, year old magnificent homes um, I lived in that neighborhood not in one of those but um, so we're going down the street and my dog starts pulling and I see what's making the noise and there's an old decrepit swing set in the backyard of one of these big old homes on the swing was a little girl, I'm getting goosebumps. On the swing was a little girl dressed in a brownie uniform, swinging back and forth, and that's what was making the creaking sound. And I'm a parent, and I the first thing I thought of was, why is this kid not in school? And then the second thing I thought of is, why is this kid out? It's 10 below zero. She's in a little cotton dress. Get inside. And so I was going to yell at her to say, hey, kid, go put a coat on. But I didn't get a chance to do that because my Malamute, she, this is Tundra, she was 130 pounds, and she, her back stood about this high. And she had bright yellow eyes, which freaked everybody out. And she looked at that little girl who was about as far away from me as you are, sir. <laughs> and uh, my dog hunkered down and started barking at this girl. And that dog had the loudest bark, but she didn't really bark very often. If you know about winter dogs, they howl and they'll talk to you, but barking is safe for very special occasions. And that little girl didn't even look up. She just kept on swinging on the swing. But my dog looked at me and pulled me hard away from there. Now, I'll leave it to you. Uh, who was that little girl? I don't know. My dog would never walk by that house again. And I never did find out. So 
Okay. Honest to God, that really did happen. How many were your kids knocking on the door of the house? You know what? I, I, I wanted to, but then it's like, what do I do? Hi, do you have a little girl that lives here? <laughs> and so I thought better of that. And, but I did kind of look for her, and I, I never did see her again. Um, so yeah, that's. How did it take that for <laughs> It was it was freaky, and my dog's reaction, I, or the hair on her back just stood straight up, and she didn't she didn't like whatever it was on that swing. So can you tell uh, how did you all three of you end up coming to together to for this evening? We are high school classmates, <laughs> kind of, kind of. I'm one year ahead. Those are elders. <laughs> and I'm 79, they're 80. And I, I know very well that they have, that my friends here had novels published, and I wanted to do a reading, and too scared to do it alone, and it was fun for me to get a nice crowd. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so you went to St. Louis Park High School? The Orioles. So, so what is it about St. Louis Park that <laughs> produces so much talent? Yeah. Ooh. You know what? We talk about that all the time. And yeah. I, I know authors like Matt Goldman. Do you know Matt Goldman? Uh, I know the name. You know of Matt Goldman? also um, oh, the New York Goldman. Times guy. Thomas Friedman. Thomas Friedman. And let's not forget Al Franken. Al Franken. The Coen brothers are from St. Louis Park. brothers. Dan um, Wilson and Peggy Ornstein, who are my classmates. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know what, Matt? Matt Coleman, who's now, he wrote for, he was on the writing staff for Seinfeld. And I always thought he wrote for um, Roseanne. And he, this was like six or seven years ago. He and I were catching up at Barbette. And I said, so Matt, what was it like writing for Roseanne? And he's like, Wendy, I didn't write for Roseanne. Who did you write for? And he said, Seinfeld. And I freaked out. I told everybody in the, in the bar. Like, he wrote for the most successful comedy in the history of television, people. But, and now he's an author. And we talk about what was in the St. Louis Park water. I think it was the English teachers. Yeah. I, really I, was, do. I was recruiting to get some teachers here tonight, and I, I don't see any. But, uh, I really do. I think it were, was our it English was a, department. Well, we had a very good staff. I, um, I, I'll vouch. I want to say some words about my old math teacher, Raleigh Hanks, if you're out there. Because oh. I thought he was going to come. Joel Tormone is on Facebook. Yeah, I thought he was. I, I thought he'd be here. Show too. But there were some really wonderful teachers. Yeah, and there were a few clinkers who. We there were a few clinkers. We won't, we won't mention that. <laughs> <laughs> but I really do think that you know the um, the writers in us, the creative people, really had so much support. And I didn't ever consider having any other career. I've always been a writer, and. Um, I think that was due to our teachers. I'm getting the sign. We have like time for one or two more questions, and then we'll adjourn to book signings. I want to encourage every. So this is a free event at a great bookstore. I want to encourage everybody to buy a book tonight. If you'd like recommendations, I have three titles I can recommend. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're full of books here. I'm sure you can you can you can find one that makes you happy, and we'll autograph anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, questions before we adjourn? Thank you so well, much. Thank you all. Thank you.